Hey friends, we're launching Visual Studio 2019 today and we wanted to try something different. Sure, there's going to be demos and code and lots of fun, but I think it's easy in today's internet to forget about people. And I drove up from Portland for this event to show you that there's hundreds of folks here in Washington and working remotely who are excited about making software for and with you. So I thought, why don't we talk to them? But first, a few notes about what's happening today. We're going to have live stream sessions after the keynote. There's a virtual attendee party on Twitch and there's on-demand sessions that are actually available right now. I also want you to go to Twitch because there's going to be all-day interactions with the program managers and the programmers that built Visual Studio 2019. Remember that Visual Studio 2019 and VS 2019 for Mac is now available for download at visualstudio.com. Now, if you're using Visual Studio today, you're probably using one of the many extensions available. Our amazing extension partners have already updated over a thousand extensions to be compatible with 2019, and you can get those in the marketplace. We're also releasing Visual Studio Live Share today, which is integrated with Visual Studio 2019 and can also be used in Visual Studio Code. We're going to chat about Live Share a little bit later. Also, DevOps is an important part of the developer lifecycle, and Azure DevOps Server 2019 is generally available as of March 5th. We're going to cover Azure DevOps and GitHub in more detail, both in this keynote and during the live stream after. Now, let's go and find some of the people that made all this possible. And I also want you to keep an eye out for some of the little gems and Easter eggs that we've hidden in this video. And let us know online using the hashtag VS2019 if you find them. Hey, friends. Hey, Scott. How are Welcome. you? Welcome. Uh, this is a great room, but it's a beautiful day outside. So if you don't mind, we could have our meeting on the deck. Sure. Right, Why not? Yeah. Get some chairs. Yeah. Grab some chairs. Oh. Good. I'm glad we got such good weather. Yeah, uh, it is gorgeous. It's better to be outside than to be in a, a conference room, even a nice conference room like the Treehouse. For sure. So, Julia, you're in charge of all of DevDiv, but have, you've worked here for a while. You've had basically every job in the developer division, haven't you? I sure did. And we've got a little gift for you here. Did the you? <laughs> worst name Microsoft product ever. <laughs> did, you, did you work on this? I sure did. It's very useful. Yeah? Visual Basic for the web. Really? <laughs> it says you can make dynamic applications. It's quite nice. It is. <laughs> Are we still using some of your code? I think it is in there indeed. <laughs> That's awesome. It's we're on also fun. Visual <laughs> Studio, right? Because we're now doing Visual Studio 2019. That's 22 years ago. That's right. And uh, that's the first version of Visual Studio ever. So in uh, two years ago, we celebrate 20 years of Visual Studio. That's fantastic. Um, and it's kind of, uh, I have uh, something to do with every single version of Visual Studio. Yeah. So uh, if you ever had any problem with it, I have something to be blamed for. <laughs> <laughs> I also heard that it was important that everyone be able to develop. There was a huge push for accessibility. You want to make sure that it works for everyone, no matter what language that they speak. Having everyone to be able to be a developer was a priority as well. So we're looking at how we can make developers more productive. We're looking at developers sitting in every corner of the world mm. and their feedback. We also have 23% of our team located outside of Redmond. So yeah. that's another very important source of information. There's a huge amount of people that are remote, myself included. I would have guessed it was single digits, but it's over almost 25% of that's people right. who are remote. And now we get to use cool things like live share to go and collaborate. Now, Amanda, you own do you hear the term? Yeah, I always find own. that's a funny term. Why do we say that at Microsoft? You own know. Visual Studio I don't know. Tooling. It's always been that way, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. <laughs> yeah. So you, I, own, I, yeah. you own that, right? <laughs> yeah, I work on Visual Studio. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're, so, you're so modest. Uh, I work on Visual Studio. Yeah. But you, 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 own, you own that. So when that means ownership, that means the shipping, the getting it out the door, the making sure that it's focused on the right things, that it's yeah, doing the right thing. Yeah, I mean, basically my job is to make sure that we ship the right product at the right time. But I, I am told from people who know both of you, that, that you, still, you still somehow find time to code. There's times when you'll say, this code doesn't do the way thing I want it to do. And I've also heard people say, when talking about you, Julia, that uh, 
um, why did, how did she know that? And someone says, oh, well, she had your job before you. <laughs> you know, well, Julie was the engineering manager for that, or she was responsible for this. Like, you both had basically every job as you've worked up to the places that, you, that you're at. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've been in the developer division at Microsoft since 2001. Yeah. So uh, almost 18 years, I guess, and I've worked on pretty much every, every product at Microsoft, but from the developer lens. So, mm. you know, I've worked on Xbox at some point and SQL and Azure and Office, pretty much everything. And to your point earlier around, do I actually still get to code? Yes, I actually do. <laughs> um, it doesn't happen as often as I like it to, um, but, but pretty much everybody on my team, and we're the, the PM team, so the, mm -hmm. the product manager team, everybody on my team codes. And we have to because our customers are developers. And so for us to actually evaluate the product, we have to do it. It's surprising to see how many people are writing documentation. Uh, someone was telling me that they saw some check-ins from Scott Guthrie, that he may have been up late at night doing some <laughs> documentation check-in. We yeah. had to build a system to make it really easy. So one of the things we did is that we rebuilt a documentation engineering system mm -hmm. to be based on GitHub. And so, and then, and then there's repos out there for every single language that we support, and people can just do a pull request if they find any issues mm -hmm. with our documentation. And we really encourage everyone to you know, work and help improve the documentation that our customer actually in the end read. That's interesting that you bring that up because there's a series of systems that are making all the loops. We talk about the developer inner loop and yep. the outer loop. Mm -hmm. All these loops are being tightened up whether it be how we make software, how quickly we ship software, the quality mm -hmm. bars, all mm -hmm. of the things. Everything's continuous integration deployment. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I think that the way we think about it is that even though people think about Visual Studio as a client software, you know, uh, that installs on your machine. But internally, we really treat it very much as a service. Hmm. We're continuously improving it. We're continuously looking at the you know, feedback customers give us in every way that they do. Uh, and then our goal is to make the product better and better, you know, every day. That's pretty cool. And I've been using, but in the past, you know, I, I would use like Skype or Teams, and I would send a screenshot, like a moving picture of my Visual Studio, but uh, that was really inefficient, especially when I was tethering my phone or I was overseas, I was really having a challenge. Uh, I never would have seen live share coming though. Like I didn't know I needed it, but then I needed it. Yeah, yeah, actually, so we did a lot of interviews over probably two or three different years of particularly focusing on development teams that are focused on time to market as their top concern when they choose their tools and their processes. And what we found was that a lot of teams were really struggling with collaboration. Hmm. And they were especially struggling with collaboration with, with remote employees. And you know their, their definition of who was a remote employee was actually pretty uh, uh, static. You know, it was even to the point that some people didn't want to hire any more engineers on their team, even though they had business demand. Hmm. Because dealing with somebody who actually was physically in a separate room, even if it was down the hall, was too much cost. It was clear that we had to do something that was pre-check-in time because you know the check-in time is basically too late. Yeah. At that point, you, you already have a pretty high cost to be able to get uh, review feedback, and then you end up with iteration cycles where you have to kind of hand it off. It's as efficient as like email, yeah, yeah. right? Um, but, but that's really where LiveShare came from. We mm -hmm. kind of figured out if we could actually enable collaboration um, ahead of the check-in and make it possible for you to collaborate in real time, mm -hmm. that that would, that would be a lot more productive. You know, we also have situations where people have different accessibility needs, and so they mm -hmm. might have different kinds of settings on their developer desktop. Like mm -hmm. they use Narrator, or you know, they might use a high contrast mode, which might make it very, very uncomfortable for you to actually share my screen, yeah. right? Um, but with LiveShare, you can actually connect into my environment. You don't have to do anything to get your dev box to be set up other than have Visual Studio or VS Code on your machine. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see my environment. You could even execute commands in the terminal if I give you that access. Now, as you know, I'm a C-sharp fan. I'm all about C-sharp. I love C-sharp. But I'm noticing, then I think Microsoft is noticing, that hybrid solutions, multi-polyglot solutions mm -hmm. are the, the, the word of the day. Not everyone is going to use just .NET. Visual Studio suddenly supports basically everything. Was that, a, was that a conscious decision that it would support all of these languages? We want to be want to build the best tool to support any customer no matter what kind of application or service you want to develop on any operating system. Mm -hmm. So that is a core pivot of what we're doing from a strategy perspective. Now you see us really follow that up with our investment in 
you know, Visual Studio Code, which is obviously open source and cross-platform. We made .NET open source and cross-platform. And that become a common theme yeah. in how we do everything. I, I, I had a moment where I was literally in Visual Studio on Windows in C++ doing remote debugging to Linux. Mm -hmm. And it just worked. It was a joy. And I was in the middle of doing it. And before I did, I'm doing remote debugging in Visual Studio That's on Linux. Right. And it's just working just great. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't feel like I was doing something I shouldn't have been. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, if, I, if I think back to 2001 when I came to Microsoft for the first time and used Visual Studio for the first time because the first version was out and then mm -hmm. uh, in the .NET era. And, uh, you know, I had come from an Emacs Unix background in college. I had I experienced IntelliSense for the first time. It's this magical thing, yeah. right? <laughs> and your productivity uh, from you know kind of an Emacs environment into a Visual Studio environment where you have this assisted development experience is pretty dramatic. Um, so I still remember that moment. But but you know now thinking back on where Visual Studio was in that era and where it is today, it's. We, we continue to create more and more of those magical moments. I, I met, I was meeting with some kids at a college recently and they told me that their professor was forcing them to use Notepad without IntelliSense because they thought IntelliSense would rot your brain. Right. And I didn't have the heart to tell them that IntelliCode was going to completely change the way that they wrote software. Now we've got AI assisted IntelliSense that's mm -hmm. coming, IntelliCode that people can see with Visual Studio 2019. I'm assuming, though, that that's just the beginning of what we could do with AI from a programming yeah, perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, AI could really impact the entire software development life cycle, um, from everything to, you know, obviously completing your 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 statements, mm -hmm. right? And we will get to the point where we can not just complete, you know, what is the next IntelliSense thing completion that you're going to pick, but actually the entire parameter. I mean, the entire line of code that you're writing, or even potentially an entire code snippet. Wow. Um, but not just that. Finding code defects, for example, you know we've found classes of issues that AI can uncover that your your classic static analysis uh, really could never discover before. Mm -hmm. um, but we will then be able to take it further into you know things like testing or um, encouraging you to follow certain practices in terms of you know who you seek code reviews from. So this is really just the beginning. Right. That's exciting. So yeah. this is just the beginning of AI and what it could mean for a Visual Studio developer. Yeah, and I think the goal, just like with IntelliSense, is you know we should really be focused on making sure that every keystroke that you write is more efficient, right? Mm. We really want to make sure that you're writing the code that only you can write, right? And so if there's anything that we can we can automate in the system that will actually allow you to become more productive and more expressive, mm. then that's the kinds of things that we. Right. Focus so on. you add value where you can add value, and the boring parts. Yeah, I mean, it's bit. really, we add value where the machine can add value, right? Yeah. And so if the machine in the cloud can add value and make you more productive as a developer, then that, that seems like goodness. You can actually write more code for your business. How did you decide what is going to be in Visual Studio 2019? Like, what are the principles and the priorities and the scope of this is this release and this is that release? Well, for VS 2019, we really plan on four core themes. The first one is performance. Making sure our product is faster and faster with each release is very important to us, to our customers. Mm -hmm. The second one is a look at big industry trend. How do we make sure customers are developing cloud-native applications in containers in an easy way? Mm -hmm. That kind of common theme. The third thing we'll look on is really helping with a team collaboration and identifying issues as early as possible. And the fourth one we really look at are a bunch of delighter features across the product where people find value with the upgrade. Mm. But how do you know what she's saying is correct and the customers really <laughs> want that? Well, I mean, for every single one of these areas, mm -hmm. we actually go through an iterative process where we identify who are the potential customers for that particular feature set, mm -hmm. and we we bring them into labs or do call downs with them and interview mm -hmm. them. Um, and those lab those lab studies are where people can actually play with early prototypes of the product in an environment where we can actually watch how successful they are with the product. So I would definitely encourage you to go check out the UX lab. So I can go find real customers working on future versions of Visual Studio in a lab. So yes. I've had experiences with companies like Microsoft or maybe Microsoft in the in the long distance past where Microsoft was there to like validate assumptions and push 
agendas. Yeah. But you didn't even start with that. You were immediately like, let's go and meet a customer and let them lead the discussion. Yeah, I like to use the term customer-led inquiry because um, it's the idea that that we don't know when we first start that conversation where it's going to lead to, mm. right? And so we should be open to the idea that it'll lead to some places that we didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And if we can uncover a more urgent problem that the customer has that we could address, then that's much more valuable than getting validation that the idea that we thought uh, was, was the biggest problem to solve uh, is actually what we need to go solve. When we're bringing new people in, though, I've noticed that in the past it has taken like months and months to ramp people up. You can't really just hire someone and have them sit around for six months. You really want to onboard them. Like, how, how are you bring people onto the team in a, an organized fashion and get them both into the culture and into the tooling as quickly as possible? Yeah, I mean, actually, one of the things that we've instituted in the last couple of years is this notion of a dev div boot camp. So if you're a new employee, either you know you're on another team and you join our team, or if you're brand new to my Microsoft entirely, then you'll spend basically two weeks uh, getting kind of a boot camp <laughs> into what it's like to work in DevDiv. How do you develop a sense of shared culture at, in DevDiv so that everyone is all feeling the same about the product and feeling the same about each other? Well, for culture, one of the key things we learned is that we really need to have shared goals, shared languages, and make sure we're changing our actions to actually embrace a new culture values. So for us, customer obsession is a core key value that we're embracing. So we're looking at how we're developing our product in a different way to really embrace that particular value. It seems like there's been a real focus on, on data. I've seen more dashboards, there's TVs, and, and everywhere I turn, there's a dashboard showing the build and the burn down chart, all these kind of things. Are, are you really pushing to be data driven in your decisions? Absolutely, not only from a developer internal engineering process perspective, but most, more importantly, we want to look at data that our customer are giving us, their particular feedbacks, you know, our crash rate, reliability in the wild, not only in the engineering internal environment. Those are critical data points to help us understand what is the customer experience with our product while they're using it every day. Mm -hmm. And I was told that every release has to be better than the last release. Absolutely. That's like an important goal. That's a very important metric that we track every day. And then we have weekly meetings that we actually look at this metric in terms of is customers you know, success in acquiring a product, installing a product, updating a product better today than last week. Is customers you know, experience with reliability and crashes and performance better you know, this week than last week? And then how are we responding to the customer feedback they have provided? Well, that's super cool. Uh, but now I want to know who to go and visit. Who should I talk to first about Visual Studio? Well, I mean, in some ways, you could really go to Building 18 and just talk to anybody who's there, and yeah. they could talk about what's going on with Visual Studio. Um, but I'd also suggest that you go to the UX lab as well and see kind of what we're studying today. OK, cool. I'm going to yeah. go wander around Building 18. I'll check out the UX lab, and I'll try to find some uh, more cool people that are working on Visual Studio 2019. Awesome. Thanks for talking to me. Thank you, Scott. Have fun Building 18. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. It was fun. Hey, Scott, want to play? I don't really play Smash that much. Competitively. Oh, look at you. You guys ready? Hey, Visual you ready? Studio Dude, it's going to be great. Ooh, it's going to be awesome. Pie. Hey, Scott. Ooh, I want to see a Raspberry Pi. Well, we've got Hi, one everybody. right here. Awesome. Right. Talk about Visual Studio 2019. Let's do it. Yay! Yeah. Yay. I'm very happy to be here. I just came over from the treehouse. I saw Amanda and I saw Julia, and she said that you all are the folks to talk to to show me some of the cool stuff in Visual Studio. Why don't we start with you, Pratik? Awesome. So I, I remember when I started up Visual Studio 2019, I was surprised how fast it started. It went right to the start window. Yeah, so this is it's a small modal UI, and it starts really fast, faster than actual the whole Visual Studio IDE starts. And um, what happens is when it loads, it also asynchronously loads your most recently used projects. So this is the same recently used projects list that you had in VS 2017. So all of your pinned items, your solutions, folders, remote repositories, all show up in this recently projects list for you to access really fast with a single click and then get to your code really fast too. So the whole point is to get me to my code as fast as possible. And I've got mm -hmm. it, I've pinned the ones that matter the most to me. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. And That's the cool. thing that I find the most cool though is I click on clone or check out code. So I double click, click on clone, paste, 
enter, and then I've just brought something down from GitHub or wherever. Right, right. If you have the URL, that's awesome. You can just paste in your URL and then hit enter, and then it clones the code. If you don't, if you don't remember the URL or you don't want to go to the web to get it, you could also sign into your GitHub or Azure repos accounts, mm -hmm. and then you can see a list of all the repos that you or your organization has, and then that you can just search for or click on, and then clone it down as well without the URL. Very cool. So autocomplete for my repos in the cloud, and then boom, I'm there. Yep. Awesome. Exactly. So when I create a new project, this is new. Like this is like a tagged new version of file new project. Right. Yeah. We totally revamped the uh, create new project process. Instead of a single window that has a tree view um, that w has been a little overwhelming to some of our um, users, mm -hmm. we decided to simplify it and make it a search based view. Um, so you can really easily and quickly search for the types of templates that you're looking for. And you can, if you don't remember exactly what you're searching for, um, you can use the filters. So there's language, pr platform, and project type drop down. And you can filter by them and get a smaller list and like narrow it down there. And then you search maybe to even filter in further. So, um, click on the template that you want. That's one decision. Then we move you to the next decision, which is configuring your project. And that um, you enter in your name, location, and then you hit go, and you have your project created. I love that when I was scrolling around in the window here and looking for what I wanted, it got the impression that maybe I wasn't finding what I wanted and tried to offer, like, are you finding what you need? Are you, uh -huh. are, are you, are you able to get what you want here? It's a much, much smarter window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we were, that was what we were trying to do. One of the things that I was impressed with was how many choices there are when you pull down platform mm -hmm. or when you pull down project type. Mm -hmm. It's just so weird to be in Visual Studio 2019 and see Linux and Android and TVOS. Da, 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 mm -hmm. da, da. All yeah. these things are tagged. Yeah, and Visual Studio has all of those things to offer. So even if you haven't installed them and you haven't used them, say you're a C++ developer and you're doing C++ and you don't know and that Visual Studio does Python development as well, but this, this thing offers it to you. This tool offers... Um, um, support for Python as well, and you can quickly say, oh wait, I don't have any templates for Python, let me install them, and then it installs it for you, takes you to the installer, installs them, and then you get Python templates as well, and you can get started with Python. Very cool. So I see all the things that I could potentially build, and mm -hmm. if I don't have that workload, mm -hmm. it'll go and get it for me. Exactly. Yeah. That's hot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> On the left-hand side here, what does it say, recent project templates? What's going on there? Yeah, so um, whenever you create a project, it is a long list of templates. And so whenever you create a project, um, the templates that you use most often and most frequently stay on the left side. So if you want to quickly access, like, hey, I always create console apps, I always create class libraries, you can easily go to the left and just click on a template from there and get started with that instead of going through the main list. That's cool. There's a nice symmetry between the new start window and the new create new project window because on that left-hand side, it's the stuff I do regularly. Regular. Your recent stuff's on the left, yep. Yeah, and that was the start window in Visual Studio 2019. That's very cool. So I love the start window in Visual Studio 2019 as well. I love how easy it is to get started with a new Git repository from either Azure repos or from GitHub. I can uh, I can just get started. I can pull down a repository without you know starting up Visual Studio. I can do it right from the beginning. And these URLs are like just kind of baked into my muscle memory, so I just type them out. But yeah, I can browse them as well. It's really interesting how Git is getting baked into our lives and into our workflows and into the product right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I can stay in Visual Studio 2019 and manage my pull requests. Um, and Julia mentioned actually at the Treehouse that she wants to bake quality in and they want to catch things you know, before the commit. But then once the commit has happened, they want to make sure the quality gets through the entire process. Oh, absolutely. I think that's critical. So you know, um, I can, of course, you know, write some code and run some tests inside VS 2019. But I also want to catch that as soon as somebody opens a pull request. So if I have a project on GitHub, mm. like an open source project, and I want to take contributions, I want to make sure that their code is good. I want to make sure it builds, and I want to make sure the tests pass. So I want continuous integration for my GitHub projects, for my Azure repos projects. And I use Azure Pipelines for that. So Azure Pipelines has uh, .NET Core 3 ready to go. We've got hosted build agents in the cloud. So we've got Mac, we've got Windows, and we've got Linux. All of them are running the new .NET Core 3, the latest preview. Uh, and it's ready to go. So I can actually do my continuous integration right there. So we talked about how a Git is getting incorporated into our lives and also being remote and remote collaboration is incorporated to our lives. You're actually uh, remotely collaborating with John right now. John? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm working with my colleague Jonathan, and he's actually working from home right now, and we're actually trying to work on Teams, and he's trying to do a screen sharing with me to be able to work on his Node app. Mm -hmm. And instead of it being lockstep, trying to negotiate control one person driving or not, with LiveShare, we're able to independently collaborate while working at our own pace. So rather than pushing 4K pixels with Teams from a remote location, mm -hmm. you're actually remoting the, the context of the entire application? Yeah, so it's a simple link, and with that, I can hop into his project, and I get the full context of that. So I can see on the side, I can see all the files and folders that he's working with. A terminal actually reopens with all the commands that he was running before this, so I get full context into that. And finally, I am able to see the, the file that he's working in, and we can see the highlights and cursors as we're going along. Now, when I was peeking over here and seeing what he was doing before, it looked like he was in VS Code on a Mac, but suddenly now I'm seeing the same Node code in Visual Studio 2019 on Windows. Yeah, so I'm working in Windows on Visual Studio 2019, and I don't even have the Node workload or Node.js actually installed on my computer, but it's all working on my side because it's all being forwarded from his machine. And I'm noticing his cursor and his name are appearing. He's selecting code right here and showing you what to be looking at. So yeah, so with his highlights, he's able to give me some context on the issue that he's looking into. That's super cool. Mm -hmm. So what about debugging, though? Um, yeah, so actually I'm able to set down breakpoints, and those breakpoints are synced to Jonathan's machine. I can even hit F5, and my debugger starts and it attaches to the running app on his machine. Okay, but when you hit F5 and it runs on his machine, do you still have to do a screen share to see what's going on? So with LiveShare, the server for the front end is actually shared with me, so I can pull that up in my browser to be able to see it on my side as well. So your localhost 5000 is his localhost 5000? Exactly. And then you can click around the website in order to hit the breakpoint. Yeah, and we can even negotiate control for debugging, stepping over, stepping into methods between the two of us. I'm impressed. That is very cool. OK, last question. Mm -hmm. What about IntelliSense? So yeah, so you're actually able to get all the IntelliSense completions forwarded from Jonathan's machine to mine. With this being a Node app, if I start typing, I can hit dot, and I get a full completion list of all the things that work for this app. So everything from his machine watches, and all the context that is the app is being sent over to you? Yeah, so I'm able to get that full context on my side and work at my own pace. Interesting. Is, would even your feature be forwarded? I, I do believe it would. So IntelliCode works on LiveShare, and you've got IntelliCode running on your machine right here. Yep. What's this demo that you've got? Yeah, so first I'm just going to show you sort of our, our base case, as we call it. So for years, we heard from our users, IntelliSense is wonderful. I love it. It helps me so much. But you have to be able to do better than alphabetically. Like, we're, we're all computer scientists. We're smart, right? We can make it better. So what we did is we took the wisdom of the community. And what I mean by that is we took you know, hundreds of open source repositories on GitHub. We scanned through them to try and find the most popular practices for you know, APIs, for strings, for asserts. And now when you use any of those within Visual Studio, you know, if I do some sort of string variable dot, it will give me this list of recommended suggestions. So are you saying that you taught Visual Studio what I'm most likely to type based on what thousands and thousands of programmers that are better than I have already typed? Yes, that's exactly what we did. So we took, as, you know, as I said, our, our tagline, wisdom of the community. We took that whole community input and sort of infused IntelliSense with it so that you can get better recommendations. So now at the top of your IntelliSense list, you get these starred recommendations that are most likely what you want. Okay, so that's amazing that you brought me like the wisdom of the ancients uh, mm -hmm. uh, up from the, all these open source projects. But my project isn't open source. I really want like my own custom model that's for me and my team, but that's not for you. Yeah, no. So we've actually just built that feature, so you can do that now. All you have to do is open the solution that you want a custom model for. Head to the IntelliCode page, click Train on My Code, and we create a custom model just for you. It's private to you and whoever you choose to share it with. So if you think your team would benefit from these custom IntelliCode recommendations, you can also share your wisdom with them. Oh, okay, and then you kind of union them, so I get both the public wisdom and then the wisdom of my own team? Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then those stars are, are going to keep me from having to scroll and, and go down into the Zs and the oh, Ys. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. And what's really cool is that it changes depending on your context, right? So if you're just in the body of a method versus if you're in an if statement versus in a for or an else, you could get different recommendations at each point there. So ideally, 
you just have to tab enter, tab mm -hmm. enter, tab enter is what we always Are you trying to say that programming for me is just going yeah, to be Yeah, it's just going to be two things, yeah. That's cool. And what language is going to do this with? So right now in Visual Studio 2019, you can use IntelliCode for C Sharp, XAML, and C++. Mm. And in Visual Studio Code, you have it for TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, and Java. Well, now you're just showing off. <laughs> She brought a Raspberry Pi, which I think is amazing. Thank you very much. Of course. Uh, is this machine talking to the Raspberry Pi? It is. So our Windows 10 application that we've built in Visual Studio 2019 has actually, you know what, let me deploy it. So I will go ahead and deploy our Windows 10 app. And now it is successfully Ooh. on our Raspberry Pi because I've installed Windows 10 on it. Isn't mm -hmm. that cool? That's overachieving. Very yeah. nicely done. So this application will tell us if Visual Studio is ready to launch. In fact, it says, is it time to launch? Do you want to try it? Let's find out. Touch screen. Is it time to launch? It, it is. Time to launch. It's yeah. Very cool. I hope everyone tries it out. That's just fantastic. Well, thank you so much for showing me this. I'm going to go find a soda pop if I can get you anything. I'm yeah. good. I'm good. All right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and then we'll go find some more PM to talk about Visual Studio 2019. Cool. Awesome. Have See you. Yeah. All right. See y'all. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, now we can relax. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so we've got SDK, we've got Python, SCPS for Mac, we've got the Azure Developer Platform. Can we peek in one of these? Yeah, let's go ahead and take a, look, a look in Lab 1. So okay. this is the Visual, Visual Studio Code Python study. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing here is people with uh, developers that have experience in Python but are using Visual Studio Code for mm -hmm. the first time with our Python extension. Can I open the door? Yeah, the absolutely. I don't want to, like, anger the beast. Can they see us? So what you're seeing here is that on the other side, our participants, they can't see us. It's a one-way mirror, so think law and order. Uh, so they can't see anyone on the product team, but the product team can see exactly what they're doing on the other side. And the beauty of these type of studies is that we can not only see every mouse click that they have on this screen, but we can see their uh, body language. So you're doing this every single day? Yes, we have over 10,000 customer engagements every single year. Um, many of them come in the form of surveys, one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews, or focus groups, or site visits. Mm -hmm. So this is our culture room. Uh, let me grab Travis. He'll walk us through. Travis. Hey, so we're showing the culture room. Uh, so the culture room is a room that we walk teams through to help them understand about what we're trying to achieve. Uh, in really becoming a customer obsessed org. You know, we know that Satya is walking us through every day trying to transform this company into being, uh, creating zero distance between us and the customer. So we spend a lot of time in this room thinking about how we can change our culture to better connect with our customers and really bring zero distance uh, between us and engaging with our customers. So we talk a lot about hacking our culture and we're spending a lot of time with our customers. It's so important that our developer community gives us feedback every single day in terms of uh, where we're headed with the product and what we're trying to do. It's so inspirational that there's so much more data-driven, there's so much more customer-obsessed. Uh, it's being baked in at every level. I was surprised that you were saying you're doing these UX uh, labs every single day. Right. I hope people that are watching this are learning that this is happening and right. these, these things are being thought about. Well, and the important thing to remember too is that to engage with us, you don't have to be in the UX lab. So we have developer community and there's so many ways to be in contact with us to give us feedback about the product, even within Visual Studio, for instance. Fantastic. So we need customers to understand that we're here, we're listening, and we're engaging. We're trying to make the product better based on what they're giving us. That's great. I'm going to go find some more PMs that are working on the product. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Travis. Yeah, my pleasure. Great. Dr. Rich, nice thank to meet you so you. much. Thank you. All right, let's go find some more PMs. Oh, sweet. I think I saw uh, Hey, friends. Yeah. Hi. How's it going? Hi. I have just come from the UX lab. It's amazing. You got to go check it out. But I hear that you have some fun demos for me. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's see them. You know, I was talking with Julia and Amanda about some of the things in Visual Studio 2019 that kind of like delight people. Just little features that just make you happy when you're debugging. And you work on some of those things, Leslie. Yeah, one of the cool things that we added for Visual Studio 2019 are data breakpoints, which if you're a C++ developer, then chances are you already know about this feature. But now C Sharp and .NET Core users can rejoice because Yay! <laughs> yeah, it is now in our managed code lives. And uh, so basically, this is a feature that allows you to break when an object's value changes. So if you want to hone in on a specific value of an object and not just the whole scope of an object, this is the way to go. Cool, so you say, I want to know when that thing changes no matter where it changes and the breakpoint gets hit. Right. That's awesome. It's super cool. So like sometimes when you have like a really big application, you might have a big stateful object that's really, really deep, like a big dependency. Maybe if you're doing like a big game or something like that, and then you could use managed data breakpoints. Yeah, absolutely. Except the problem is if you have a large application like a game, sometimes mm -hmm. it can be near impossible to even debug it if you're using a previous iteration of Visual Studio. Mm. So teams across Microsoft, for instance, such as the Office team and the Edge team and um, Xbox, a couple of those teams, They've approached us like, hey, can you please let us actually debug our <laughs> really, really big apps that are usually written in C++ because right now we're just getting constant out of memory errors. So now for 2019, we have made it, we've made symbols out of proc for C++ applications. So you're now able to debug those applications without constantly experiencing those memory errors. I think I recognize this game. Is this what yeah. I think it is? Yes, this is Gears of War. So that's obviously a really big game. And as you can see, it's being debugged in Visual Studio 2019. We've also, uh, just to compare it, we've 
tried to debug it in 2017, if you look in the task manager at the memory consumption being used, the amount of memory being consumed in 2019 is significantly lower than what it is in 2017. So nice. no sweat cool. there. You should be able to debug it. And also the they gave you the source code to Gears of War, yeah, which is so yeah, awesome. Yeah, they're so nice. <laughs> So if I've got an application that works great locally, but maybe it's got a cloud service and I put that up in the cloud, what if it doesn't work well in production? How do I debug that? Yeah, so normally in the past what you'd have to do is you know, either make a repro locally, which can be really tricky, or you'd have to try to garner what the issue is from a bunch of logs and you may not even get all the relevant information that you need. Mm -hmm. So uh, Visual Studio 2017 introduced snapshot debugging, which allows you to take a snapshot of your application and debug it while the code is still running in production without any impact on mm -hmm. the end user's experience. So what we've added for 2019 on top of that is time travel debugging, which basically allows you to step through your code as you're using the snapshot debugger. Seriously, so, like yeah. literally time travel debugging. I'm moving forward and backward in exactly. time. Exactly. Yep, so you can move forward, backward, frontwards. And you get all the context about everything that's happening in your application. Yes, so yeah, you still get the full functionality of the VS debugger, so call stacks, um, watch window, locals window. Oh, that's works. awesome. Yeah. Well, I've got my application into production, but if it's, if it's got a bug and I need to debug, I probably didn't pass my unit test. What happened, Kendra? Well, um, live unit testing can actually help you make sure that everything you push into the cloud has actually had a test run. So live unit testing can automatically rerun tests every time you make a code change. Seriously, like every time you save it? Yeah, so here I can make a quick code change and you can see the test is rerunning in the background as I'm typing. As you're typing? Yeah, and I can get feedback on the test result right in the editor. Okay, wow, so that was my bad to push the bug into production next yeah, time. Yeah, it's on you, for sure. <laughs> next time I will use live unit testing. So what app are you working on, Kendra? So this is actually a little Twitter sentiment analysis app that uh, we cooked up. So it gets all of the recent tweets on Visual Studio and runs them through Azure Cognitive Services to gauge sentiment. Mm. So here I have a little emoji, searching for emoji tests because emojis are super important. Well, I gotta ask. Yeah. How did you get the emojis to display like that in the editor? Because Visual Studio is awesome and recognizes Unicode <laughs> characters. I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, so the refactoring that I just triggered um, is all of our code fixes and refactorings you can access through controlled dot. And that was one of the new refactorings, one of many that mm. we added in Visual Studio 2019, wrapping parameters. Mm. So if you have super long parameters and it's difficult to see, some people prefer the code style of wrapping every new parameter on a new line. One of the things that they were mentioning was that in the old days, I used to have to remember all of these different um, hotkeys, but now they're like control T, control dot, control Q. What's like the, is there like a ultimate refactoring? Yeah, um, so control dot, when you're in the editor, okay. will open all of the refactorings available where your cursor is. So it's very contextually clever, I mm. guess. Um, control T is our main navigation shortcut for anything inside your code. And control Q is anything within your menus and Visual Studio and tools options, that kind of thing. So I just have to remember those three hotkeys and yeah. I have the power yeah. of Visual Studio. And we have little icons that you can open to, so a little screwdriver will appear or a light bulb if you got a suggestion. Very cool. And I'm now going to put emojis in all of my code. Excellent. <laughs> One of the first things you'll notice as soon as you open Visual Studio 2019 is the new colorization. So methods, local parameters, all of your user members have new Roslyn syntax cl classifications, so they get new colors. So you can see for each is purple here. Um, parameters are this dark blue. We tried to mimic the Visual Studio code colors as much as possible. Because mm. those had already been super successful uh, in the community. And uh, we got a lot of feedback that people love them. That's cool. So you gave Visual Studio a little pop. So yes. it'll be the colors that I'm used to with just more context. Yeah. A refactoring we added to Visual Studio 2019 is for each to link. It is the latest one to join the for loop refactoring family. So we have uh, link to for each, we have for loop to for each, and converting back many of them. They're super fun to try out. It makes me feel smart because I maybe can't write the link from scratch, but I can <laughs> yeah. totally write the triply nested for loop and they go whoosh and it turns into link. Yeah, and definitely. I'm like, yeah, I wrote that myself. Everyone's like, oh, you can use link? Yeah, wow. I can. <laughs> so smart. <laughs> What if I'm getting started with a, a code base that's gonna be a little crusty and I'd like to just kind of get a jump start? I don't want to refactor like step by step. Yeah, um, a great way to apply all of the refactorings you want to is code cleanup. So you've probably 
so you configured all of the rules and tools options, what levels of refactoring suggestions, warning, or errors you want this to be triggered on. You can export those to an editor config file that lives with your repository. All of your team members can have the same editor config file, and Code Cleanup will run the refactorings that you set in that. Very so, cool. yeah, it's a great way to clean up your code. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, All right. What do you have for me? Oh, my gosh. I have so much to show you today. I'm really excited. So, Kendra was talking about those code fixes and refactorings that we have on Visual Studio 2019 for Windows now. We've actually brought the C-sharp code editor from Windows over to Mac. So, Visual Studio 2019 for Mac has the same IntelliSense. Um, code refactoring, syntax highlighting that you get on Windows now. So you're literally sharing code between the two? We are, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So here we are in a Xamarin Forms project. So Scott, as you know, Xamarin is our .NET framework to run C Sharp code on iOS and Android and watches and TVs, all that great stuff. Mm -hmm. And this project is Xamarin Forms, so 100% of the front end is in XAML, and it runs on both mm -hmm. iOS and Android. So you're sharing the UI across all of this. Yep, we are, and it's great. Uh, and this is Tailwind Trader, so it's an app we demoed at Connect in the fall. And it's 100% Xamarin Forms, and it's using a new feature we have called Shell that does all your navigation for you. Seriously? Yeah. So coloring and changing the flyouts and the tabs is super easy, very easy to customize. That was Visual Studio 2019 for Mac. Mm -hmm. So let me flip over to Windows here. Uh, I have some more great stuff to show you for Xamarin. Uh, first off, we have IntelliCode support for Xamarin Form XAML right out of the box. Nice. So you can go ahead and type out your controls and your attributes, and it just pops up with suggestions. It's really smart. We also have a property panel, so you can go in and change the colors of your controls, the layout, where they're positioned, the text, all that great stuff without actually having to write any XAML, which is very helpful. Nice. One of the things that kept me from using Xamarin before was I thought it was really uh, had a large install size, but that's way smaller in 2019. Right, we dropped the install size from 23 gigs to 7 gigs, which is fantastic. It makes it way quicker to get started. Mm. We also did a lot of work on Android build and deploy performance. So it was previously really slow, and it took a long time to spin up the emulator, and then you had to build your project, deploy your project. And that inner dev loop, we call it, was taking people a really long time. Yeah, I hear that the Android build times are way faster, and it's just a lot more fun. Yeah, the build times are faster, the deploy times are faster. Uh, the emulator for Android now supports Hyper-V. We worked closely with the Hyper-V team on that. That's great. That means I can have Android on an emulator on Hyper-V with Docker, and I can have my microservice talking to my Xamarin app. Oh, yeah. You can have it all working, and it's so much faster and so much smoother and cleaner now, so it's a lot of fun. That's great. You've got a phone right here running Tailwind Traders? I do. I also have this pair of pliers. Mm -hmm. And using 100% Xamarin Forms and, and Xamarin, we can actually take a photo of this pair of pliers right here. Okay. And it will recommend to us what we can buy that looks like this using computer vision. So wow. it's hooked so it up identified to it and it's already talked at the back end. It already has. That and it fast. says, get this red multi tool plier right here. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, it's great. So that is using a back end that's written in, in Azure. Yeah, it's all in Azure. Yeah, and we have some great tools in Visual Studio to enable you to get started developing for Azure. Mm -hmm. So I can go and write a backend really quickly, starting with Visual Studio 2019. That is correct. So one of the easiest ways we have to get started is we have a lot of project templates built into Visual Studio for dedicated Azure types, like Azure Functions. Uh, we also have ASP.NET Core, which is just a great general purpose backend that can be hosted in lots of places running in Azure. Then when you're developing as a user, we have all sorts of emulators to run things locally, so you don't even necessarily need a cloud connection when you're developing and targeting Azure, so you don't need to be running up your bill. If you want to use storage, databases, all those things are available to run locally, so you don't have to have a cloud-connected developer environment every day. I know you travel a lot, Scott. You can actually do it on the airplane. Yeah, I was really surprised how many things I was able to do developing for the cloud for Azure on my local machine with emulators for Cosmos DB, for storage, and all those kind of things. Making cloud applications on an airplane disconnected. Yeah, that is one of our goals. We hear from a lot of people that they, they like that tight loop of just being able to do everything locally without the cloud dependency you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, well, I've landed the plane, and I'm ready to go from offline to online. I'm going to put this up into Azure. Yeah, we've worked really hard to make that easy from Visual Studio. All you have to do is right-click the project, choose Publish, and you'll see a list of Azure targets available to run it. If you don't have an opinion yet, we recommend starting with Azure App Service, as we think you'll find that the easiest place to get started. 
And after you've published your application, the core part of your code that's going to run, we make it really easy to create other dependencies that the application may need to function correctly, including SQL Server and Azure Storage directly from Visual Studio. And actually, once you've published it, even if you don't need it initially, one of the new things we've added in 2019 is we've made it easy to come back and add those at any point in the application's development lifecycle. So you're making that published dialogue kind of re-entrant. I can go back in and say, I want a little SQL and I want a little storage, and add that to my existing publish? Absolutely, yeah. So if you decide that you need storage three months into development, you just add that to the app service environment directly from Visual Studio without the need to go to the portal or some other tool. That's cool. Wow. I love everything that you just showed me, except uh, my boss won't get me access to create anything new in Azure. Yeah, we hear that a lot. So one of the other things we offer in Visual Studio is the ability to choose existing resources. So as long as you have permissions to publish to the resource, you can, through Visual Studio, select an already created resource in Azure, and that same published summary tab will get populated just like you created everything yourself. In fact, we even are able to show you the SQL and storage dependencies. Fantastic. You've solved all my problems. This has been great. Absolutely. All right, well, I'm going to take off to my next thing. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, bye, guys. Bye. All right, bye-bye, everybody. That was so much fun for me. I hope you enjoyed getting to know some of the people who work on Visual Studio 2019 and taking a peek behind the scenes. As I mentioned at the start, there's a ton more content coming today with 11 live stream sessions starting right now at launch.visualstudio.com. Be sure to ask questions and let us know what you think either on Twitter at hashtag VS2019 or join us for live conversations on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Visual Studio. Whew, that was a lot. Good job, Scott. You added some value. Well, I hope we fix that in post. Cool, that's very cool. So who do you think I should go and see? See, it's fake, isn't it? It sounds so weird. Sorry. It does sound weird, because okay. we don't know what you just said. Okay. But whatever no, it was, I was face super this time, excited. I, I can actually do my continuous integration right there. That was so good. Yeah, I have it right here. Um, and it's, it's hooked up to the interwebs and running the back end. <laughs> High five on that. High five. <laughs> <laughs> we can do high five. Watch your high five. Try it again, is that okay? Hey, Kendra. Ready to come out this way? Yeah, Kendra. Stop ruining the illusion that you're standing next to Scott. <laughs> so I was able to sign in directly to GitHub from the start window. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, right. That's exactly right. And then I'm going to say something that I. <laughs> 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 <laughs>